I'll start with uh, probably just take a couple of minutes to just explain the theme of the uh, discussion. We're talking about mitigating risks on one side and we're talking about building resilience on the other side and how do we really balance the act of doing so. Uh, now, there may be many, you know, multiple interpretations of what are risks, what are, uh, you know, what, what, is, what is meant by resilience. Uh, and I think in our context, uh, when it comes to the retail industry, uh, we've just gone through a, a severe disruption, which was in the form of COVID. And we, we really saw retailers, you know, going through that uh, difficult time, recovering and coming out and, and now fairly doing well, uh, uh, back to all normal almost. Uh, in my view, mitigating those risks is really about managing anything that's unknown, uh, which could be from the external world, which disrupts our business, which impacts our revenues, which impacts the continuity of the business per se. And building resilience is really about working with, uh, you know, on the capability side to say that, you know, how do we strengthen our employees? How do we strengthen our product offerings? How do we have deeper connect with our customers, you know, to ensure that, Business still goes on, even if there are external disruptions. We fare better than our competition, you know, if we are more resilient. That's the perspective that I think I would like uh, our speakers to have in mind. With that, uh, maybe I'll, uh, you know, we've got an interesting mix. We've got uh, fashion retailers, we've got uh, grocery, and we've got service providers. So maybe uh, I'll come to uh, Anoop first. Uh, Anup, uh, you run Kirana King. Uh, I think you've been closest to, to see, you know, how the Kiranas, the mom and pop stores in the country got disrupted. Uh, it's also a fact that a lot of consumers really depended on that layer to, uh, to, to be catered for their needs during the most difficult times of the lockdown. So if you can throw a little bit of light about uh, what were your experiences, what did you learn from this whole experience? So thank you, Shubhajit, and thank you to all of you. So as a, basically, see, all of us, everybody during this pandemic time understood the value of uh, Kirana stores, right? So, but we at a Kirana King level, right, basically. So we can foresee, basically, during last couple of years, that what is the value of moment of in stores? Whereas basically most of the consumers and various other stakeholders have realized the value of moment pop stores during this pandemic difficult time. So definitely uh, during this pandemic time, there were a lot of challenges in terms of maintaining the supply chain and uh, of course motivating all team members in the supply chain to work, right? So definitely the, the, the resilience what we have developed uh, among uh, uh, internally team members and uh, the various stakeholders has shown us a different capability, right? So what I can say that in Indian grocery retail ecosystem, uh, whether it's a consumer or retailers have realized the value of the moment pop stores at the same time, uh, especially Kirana stores also have realized that the way consumer behavior is changing and the consumer shopping habit and the buying habit is changing. So there are various changes has to be made in terms of their way of doing business. So definitely, uh, see the difficult times comes and difficult time goes, you know, like see, but what exactly you learn out of that so that you are ready equipped to face the, um, this kind of unfortunate circumstances. So definitely Kirana segment and uh, what I can say that especially an entire Indian retail ecosystem, where the Kirana retail contributes a quite reasonable portion of the retail. And uh, they have shown the power. So what I need basically that during this pandemic time, of course, there was various challenges at every stakeholders, whether it's the supply chain side, whether it's the operation side, and also consumer last mile delivery or consumer visiting physically. So definitely it was a tough time. But we at a company level, whatever as a business model, which we was implementing during last few years, that helped a lot to our Kirana King stores rather than a normal Kirana stores to become more serviceable and more, you know, uh, in terms of give, providing more convenience to the consumer. So that was the overall experience of Shubhajit. So Anup, if you can just drill down that. So you said the Kirana stores enabled by your platform did a little better than others maybe who were on their own. 
just one or two specific areas where you know they derived the benefit and they could pass it on to the consumer right see overall you know see our business model lies on the entire ecosystem not about the consumer basically so we are addressing three quite large problems of the kirana uh, retail ecosystem where as we can see that uh, infrastructure and operational challenges what a traditional retailer faces and uh, second is a basically a supply chain side whereas they have to deal with the fragmented distribution ecosystem and and third is a basically demand side so i would like to elaborate all these things in detail because it's a very interesting subject for all of us so infrastructure if we realize that you know during last uh, many years everything has been changed surrounding kirana walas but they remain same whether in terms of a planogramming visibility operational capabilities digitization so they are lacking because they are so much of busy so definitely our retail as a service ecosystem brings the entire value proposition which solve all these three quite large problems so as a business uh, we are basically bringing independent kirana stores under the single brand umbrella of kirana king and connecting these stores with our centralized purchase solution and promoting these stores among consumers so we are trying to address all these three large problems so definitely infrastructure whenever we uplift their infrastructure that differentiate created in the market so there is a very quite reasonable difference between a normal kirana store and a kirana king store is visible among consumers and also they feel pride the same time supply chain side we 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 solve various problems whereas they no need to depend on the their weekly or fortnightly supply chain cycle so that help them to basically optimize their shelf space providing more variety to consumers and more brands so the ticket size of the of the volume share of the consumer can increase and the profitability can increase right and also overall how they can be competitive because the real change is what kirana stores are going to face is no during the pandemic time in my view because maybe that time the big players the modern retail and e retail was not prepared for that so maybe kirana people kirana stores got more advantage right so i think real time comes now whereas the consumer behaviors are changing so the more resilient has to be there basically in the in terms of a kirana store operators so that's what our business model help them lot to make them you know standardize centralize digitize and socialize so that they can be ready to compete for the upcoming challenges what they can see because there is you know fast penetration is going for the e and modern retail so the the business model what we have conceived and believed and executed on the ground right which covers basically all the pain points of the kirana retail ecosystem basically so whenever we address this pain pain points of kirana store operators so definitely it goes the way, the, the, the the benefits and the convenience goes to the consumer and overall they get benefited basically okay thanks thanks anup for those opening comments we'll come back and drill down a little more Uh, I'll come to both Avnish and Gautam. So uh, both of you are from the apparel slash fashion segments, and uh, I'm sure. Uh, I mean, we all know how the demand side looked like, you know, for a few months at least. So just want to take some opening comments from both of you in terms of how you see the fashion uh, retail segment uh, having changed. You know, having gone through this experience, are there learnings from this, and is the Is the fashion retailer segment overall make, taking some steps to kind of be more resilient? Uh, can I go first? Yeah. yeah. Sure. So I think uh, I think post post COVID post lockdown, the preferences of the consumer as far as uh, fashion and utility products have actually kind of changed. So what we are seeing in the market is that people are buying more of comfort wear and lounge wear. You know, I think earlier. uh preferences were more high fashion and people were traveling i think post covid we are seeing that people are buying more stuff so that you know they can comfortably work from home so the we have all started we all retailers have started developing a work from home you know collection so lounge wear and uh, your lounge wear and comfort wear is something which is leading right now as far as the uh, fashion space is concerned and uh, i think this trend is changing i mean uh, i think a lot of things uh, the taste and preferences of all customers have I've gone through a big change after COVID. Avnish, your thoughts? Yeah, Subhit. Actually, uh, when you talk about Nehru's, uh, particularly as because we are into hardcore ethnic category, 
and not just a purely fashion so we do everything from a kurti to a wedding lehenga so no you know how the pandemic time was when there were no weddings and you know when you do uh, our specially our category is one of those category it's all about showing unless you show it's not going to be uh, bought you know it's not going to be there if there are no weddings if there are no occasions no festivals nobody's coming gathering together and having those celebrations so when you have nowhere to show so why are you going to buy that category so like how gautam said so in the period from say april till uh, until say september was a time when people were choosing a lot of lounge wear and lot of uh, fast fashion category like uh, uh, at neeroos we used to do a category called uh, we still do it's called everyday ethnics so when you talk about everyday ethnics is something which is more comfortable in terms of the uh, feel of the fabric of the product and the kind of uh, silhouette it has it's more simple it's good for people to sit at home and uh, you know just roam about in that comfort wear and those uh, comfortable fabrics and uh, kind of uh, cuts and fits we used to give them but there was a total uh, uh, change in the trend and pattern because now when we were getting comfortable with the everyday ethnic the sudden surge in the period of october november december when you saw a lot of festivals coming back uh, in the uh, uh, months like the diwali the sehra karwa chauth you know what india is all about it's a it's an amalgamation of uh, such great festivals coming at once so there was a total shift from that lounge way and now suddenly there was a huge demand of festival so people like us when we are actually so drilled down and uh, when we plan our otb is that's the open to buy that we actually do so we were highly confused on what has to be done during such times and such periods when we are getting comfortable with a fast fashion category and then suddenly people have come back bounced back in a manner where they actually saw that they wanted uh, those categories back again which was little heavier ethnic wear more of a uh, occasion where also some small weddings of 50 to 100 people depends on states and regulations were happening so there was so much of uh, turbulence happening in our category but we always saw one thing that when there is a push in the uh, gatherings in the festivities in the weddings and everything people are actually coming out spending money not thinking twice maybe the wedding used to be about 1000 people 900 people used to come and buy now the weddings are 100 200 people you just have about 150 50 people coming to buy so maybe that footfall of that that gap must be there but then the people are actually coming out they have not gone down in their ticket sizes they still want to buy everything at that price they don't want um, um, uh, any kind of compromise for that kind of a fashion segment that they're looking at so there was a lot of turbulence like uh, like i said from april to september was one period october november december was one january i think major majority of brands like us had gone under the end of season sale and we also saw a huge uptick in the sales figures during that time people actually came out they were they were waiting for a lot of such kind of offers and uh, everything to come down because they knew the weddings are going to come back there going to be a lot of festivities so they actually spent money they didn't compromise even during the end of season sales and actually came out and bought because they knew that that they got uh, something at a very uh, uh, affordable deal so even that kind of uh, uh, went well with a lot of us although if you talk about learnings then i think inventory management was one of the biggest biggest learning for uh, people in the fashion segment because if you are in a hardcore fashion category not in the basic category you have to be up uh, keeping up with the trends and if you i can't sell a past season uh, merchandise minus 2 minus 3 season today because in especially in ethnic everything changes so fast and we have to be on our toes always so that kind of uh, uh, gave us a breather and uh, we understood the pattern of people although it gave a good uh, uh, birth to the category of everyday ethnic so that's kind of doing good with us and we have special uh, uh, arrangements of manufacturing and supply for the whole uh, category of that sort yeah excellent excellent so good thing is both of you touched upon a little bit about the uh, you know the dynamics of assortment because only certain categories were clicking at certain points in time and then again you saw the reverse sweep you know the moment things opened up i think there were a lot of pent up emotions of the shoppers to come in and shop because they hadn't been shopping for a long time so uh, you spoke a little bit about those agile manufacturing arrangements the the supplier part of it to uh, you know accelerate the buying process essentially can you can you both throw a little bit of light in terms of uh, you know how did you kind of probably plan for agility both in the planning and buying processes uh so during a buying process uh, so our entire buying happens on the basis of sales forecasting 
So it works backward integration, uh, it backward calculate from what our sales forecast is because ours is a more core and utility product. So what we had basically done is we had estimated that this time the uh, the festive season is going to be probably 75 to 80 percent of what was last year's festive time. So we had bought and purchased according to that. So ours is uh, still an easier model to source because our be the product be ours is a round the year product. So the product it is we could very easily calculate it and then realize that we have to procure only 80% of what our actual strength is. So that helped us like what, uh, you know, what uh, he Avinash mentioned that um, during this time for any retailer, inventory optimization is a must because inventory is technically cash. So the, if you're able to, if you're able to optimize your inventory, nothing like it. So we, uh, we uh, did our inventory sourcing very carefully and we calculated based on sales forecast. Okay, and uh, Avnish, any a little bit of more drill down on the, uh, you know, how how you kind of prepared suppliers to maybe supply very quickly for certain categories or kept other suppliers, you know, uh, on the standby to to cater to you in the need. Uh, Subhjit, actually, when we were sitting down in the periods of uh, April, May, June, July, August, September, so we are into fashion. We are creative people. We can't sit idle. So there has been so much time spent in thinking about what has to be done next. So whatever we had planned uh, with our team, especially at Neeru's with the whole design and um, uh, manufacturing team and also with the uh, suppliers and manufacturers across the country, because being ethnic, we have the best of every city possible. So uh, uh, a good Banaras sari from Banaras, a good Kanjuram sari from Kanjuram, a good printed kurta from Jaipur, a good unstitched uh, uh, cottons from Ahmedabad. So everything we have to you know plan in a way that every taste is available to the customer at the right time and somehow in the times when we were hibernating during those couple of months we actually thought there ha there definitely will be an uptick in the numbers during the festive period although like how uh, everybody had spoken we were taking as a soft spot of uh, getting back to 75 to 80 percent of the last year month on month sales figure so keeping that in mind the otbs um, kind of uh, had a little bit of jerk but then many categories we kind of uh, created in a way that, uh, you know, when when uh, uh, people were uh, talking about months like July, August, many, where, many places, the manufacturing was also not allowed to open at that point of time. So we had our 60 to 70 percent design team ready with everything. The only thing that we had to do was say action. So your major job of actually planning your merchandise, creating the racking capacities and whatever the stock on holds you need for your X number of stores that you have. We planned everything in a way that once we say action, what category needs how much time, say a kurti would need a 15 days, a bottom would need a 30 days, maybe a, a sari would need a 45 days, uh, a, a ready-made garment will take uh, another 30 to 40 days, maybe a very high-end product uh, a wedding lenga or something might take a 60 day. So we kind of planned every category in a way and we started doing, uh, uh, getting everything into action play from August onwards. And uh, to be, uh, and surprisingly by 1st of October, I remember we were so prepared for the next three months that actually gave us the push for another uh, set of uh, designing to happen for the summer period. So now I think we are done with the summer. So summer, again, we calculated according to the same thing that however the fluctuations in the pandemic and the lockdowns and everything, how the COVID plays its role, if we again keep it at a 70 to 80 percent margin and let's not think very flamboyant on the figures, again, we actually kind of controlled our OTB in that manner. So it's all about having your design team, your production team, your sourcing team, everybody at the same table at once and sharing your thought that, you know, everybody has to stand together and, you know, everything has to go very seamlessly. So once you have that on board, it's fine. Like, for example, uh, Gotham's category is a core category. So suppose a red legging or a black legging will always remain a red and black legging. If you introduce a, a plazo or something different that is in trend today, then is when you need a whole design team to act on it and see what kind of inventory you want to hold. Or whatever is core for you will definitely be a, a smooth butter for you. But when there's a fashion element adding to it and fashion in every brand is not more than 30 to 40 percent of the entire brand. So that has to be planned well, apart from the co. Yeah, excellent. Uh, thanks for the insights. I think we'll drill down further when we come back to you. So maybe we'll uh, pick up the service providers now and uh, they directly impact customer engagement in a big way. So I'll come to maybe first Gopal. So so Gopal, uh, you... you uh, 
essentially are in the business of enabling the front line for retailers, right? Yeah. And uh, it is through people capability development, learning, uh, training, etc. And uh, you had this challenge where maybe, uh, first of all, consumers were not coming into the physical stores for a long time. So there was nothing to cater to. And the second thing was when they did come, there was a lot of sensitivity about safety protocols, about social distancing, about safety norms, essentially, which which got embedded in the SOPs. I don't think SOPs ever had those elements, you know, in any store manual. How did you step up? What what were your learnings during this period? All right. Uh, thanks, Subhajit. Uh, thanks for uh, the question and the opportunity. Uh, see, basically, B Sharp, we are in the business of providing an application for companies, which will help to train and engage and provide data to the frontline person standing in the retail outlet. So that's basically what we do, right? And uh, if you actually look at the last, you know, maybe 12 months, I can see it in four, three different phases, right? The first three, four months, the next four months and the next four months. And it is sort of similar to what uh, Anup was talking about and what, what, what Avnish was talking about and Gautam were talking about, right? The first four months, all the shops were closed. All the retail outlets were closed, right? So we have customers like, say, Lenovo, Dell, IFP, those type of people. And they're all retail outlets were closed. People, the big challenge which companies had was, how do I ensure continuity? How do I make sure that the morale of the people is intact? And... At that point in time, the simplest of the ideas worked the best. The simplest idea which was there at the point in time was engage every salesperson seven, seven minutes a day, right? So companies came up with all kinds of content and all kinds of programs. And they said that, okay, I'm gonna go and put this training at 10 o'clock in this app by 11 o'clock, all you guys need to consume, right? So at least there was a level of continuity. Companies were able to take care of their resilience, their, you know, business continuity, processes, morale, engagement, that type of thing in the first four months. And similar to the experience, which was, uh, you know, which Abdish was talking about, in September, the game changed, right? So there was a huge amount of engagement, which was there with respect to training. But from September onwards, the focus became, right, hygiene. This, the, the process also became, the question also became, you know, what is the data? Because new types of data were needed to be collected from the retail outlet for companies to manage, right? So the phase shifted to from hardcore training to hygiene and data. And in hygiene, things were things like, you know, how do I make the person internalize hygiene processes and protocols and things like that, right? So how do I, you know, make sure that there is no slack in the process? In the sense like, okay, two weeks I've been following the process and there's been no person who's impacted in my retail outlet. I should not drop it off, right? So how do I keep it on top of the mind month on month, month on month? Because it's going to impact, you know, the, the goodness of the retail outlet, the reputation of the outlet and making sure the customers are able to walk in and things like that, right? So the second four months was about that. And even now that's continuing in some fashion and form. But... You know, if you actually look at the last two, three months, right, from February, March onwards, it is all about getting ready for the next year, right? Getting ready for the next year, people are saying that there are going to be new products which are going to come up, right? I'm going to change my product portfolio mix in a way that it makes sense because people have incremental money in the pockets and things like that. It's going to be new processes which have to be put in place. Competition is sort of changing the you know, overall positioning of the products and things like that. In that environment, how do I go and grow in the next year? I need to be like completely agile, you know, and sort of anti-fragile in the, in the front end, you know, the salesperson whom to focus, is, right? So three different faces and three different learnings. The big thing which has come out for me, one is the importance of the frontline person. And how do you make sure that that person is first enabled with learning. Second, enabled with enthusiasm. In a sense, like he needs to form part of the company, feel part of the company, and enthusiastically communicate that value and the pride of the company to the, you know, uh, to the uh, customer, right? How that happens. And the third is, how do you build a goal-oriented frontline? Which in a sense means, I need to know what my goals are with respect to my targets, my mix, whatever that might be. And 
I need to know where I'm standing with respect to the goal. And I need to know where, how do I go there to that target, right? So this is basically the three big things which I have learned, right? And the things which have been driven are about simplicity, right? Simple things done over and over and over again on the mobile. So that's been my experience, Subhajit. No, thanks, Gopal. I, I think a lot of retailers here would, would agree to some of those sentiments. Uh, I'll come to Tejas. Uh, Tejas, uh, uh, you know, you, you've been kind of enabling a lot of retailers in this country, uh, uh, you know, to have a very robust customer 360 view. Uh, and uh, knowing the customer very deep, intimate is, is, I think, an asset, you know, during these difficult times because you, you know the customer better, you know what would be really important how would be the response of the customer? So can you share one or two examples where you saw uh, you know, very radically different results in terms of uh, how the retailer could cope with difficult times? Uh, you're on mute, Tejas. Uh, just setting some context is that, you know, obviously when pandemic came in, you know, everyone was clueless and including us, but uh, we knew that, um, that uh, you know, and that's something which we've been propagating to retail uh, for quite some time that CRM uh, and the customer is going to become the king at some point of time, right? Um, and, you know, till luckily for us, pandemic has become a, a realization for a lot of brands where they realize that the customer who has been loyal uh, who has spent uh, you know, a lifetime with them is the one who's actually going to keep on buying with them. Uh, and a lot of the brands uh, where they've really fostered uh, CRM very, very well by creating a single view of the customer, uh, they've really uh, thrived uh, pretty well to uh, you know, circumvent the issues which are happening during pandemic. Right? So uh, brands uh, where uh, we knew what kind of customers expected to come, the kind of communication that is brought in, some of the places, the personalized communication has brought in about 2x kind of responses with the customers, you know, as compared to what they were in last year. Um, like during the festive uh, seasons, we've seen, uh, you know, right even from ethnic brands to footwear, uh, doing far better than what they were doing last year at the same time, right? So uh, we've seen some phenomenal results because of personalizations of communication. Uh, brands uh, where uh, they have made the presence at an omni level and right, what you're talking about the 360 view. So the brands which have really made the effect of the customer having the same experience online, offline, obviously have been uh, far more, a little bit more unaffected as compared to the other brands because they've been able to leverage the customer across channels and have been able to benefit the customer that, hey, I am the same irrespective of whichever channel you are. Uh, so that's the two, three things which we definitely saw. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, uh, uh, what Gopal was talking that, you know, a lot of the staff were sitting idle. Uh, so, you know, I, I know both of us were on a panel before and we were discussing that some brands have actually used the staff to do call outs to their existing customer that, you know, irrespective of whatever you do, tell me what you need help for, right? And customers were asking even questions like, tell me where can I get a hospital bed, right? So we've seen brands where even they've helped out their customer, not answering about what they're talking, what the brand is all about, but helping the customer in their need. And those kind of, uh, uh, you know, leverages have actually brought some brands very close to that customer. Right? Um, what we've also seen across all brands, across all industries is obviously that the customer who's come back during the pandemic, 70% uh, of the sale has been from the loyal customer already. Uh, most of the new acquisitions from brand that stopped because marketing was stopped, right? Uh, and we always used to tell the brands that do not stop at least communicating to your existing customer. Uh, and you need to be on the top of the mind. It could be communication about what you're doing, communication about the stuff which you are helping yourself do. Uh, you know, uh, one of the brands, uh, we were telling them that why don't you teach uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the customers on how do you dress up at home to look good, right? So you say that let make, let's make the text very contextual to what is happening there and you need not even talk about selling. And I think that has really helped a lot of the brand sustain during that period. Um, and once that, you know, once the, the fear of going out went out a little bit, uh, the customer was back in action to really uh, take that leap much faster. 
so that's one thing that's uh, definitely helped. Um, and uh, one of the other things is obviously some of the brands have really evolved in how they have interacted and they've opened up new channels. Right? Uh, in another panel, which I was talking, uh, you know, what has not happened in the last 10 years, even in US, has happened in three months. The penetration of digital has gone up drastically to that level that what has never happened in 10 years has happened in three months. So the customer now is not only on offline, he's on online, he's on social, he's on, uh, you know, he's on e-commerce, he's on WhatsApp, all those channels have opened up, right? The biggest challenge with the brands are now facing, because they've not done it before, is that we've got customer sets in different buckets. How do you consolidate to create that single view? Right? And that's the next leap which the brands will have to start picking up much faster because the, brand, because the customer has started moving, right? Uh, your customer who was in Bangalore is now sitting home uh, in Indore and still, you know, loves the brand, right? So you start, you need to start bringing those channels together. You know, you, it is not, gone are the days where you can say my online will run separate, my offline will run separate, my video commerce will run separate. It has to be consolidated into that single channel. Um, and that's the, uh, the learning which we've got from brands, uh, especially the enterprise brands, which we've been serving uh, they already had that vision, right? So it was much simpler for them to really uh, action that out much quicker. And that obviously has now uh, brought them much uh, ahead of the curve because now they're leveraging that single view to understand in terms of stock, in terms of channel, in terms of where the customer is put and is able to personalize that communication effectively. on that channel. So that's been a great learning which we've seen in the last, um, last eight months now. And that's the leverage which the retail is taking uh, across ecosystems. No, thanks, thanks, Tejas. I think I think all the points that you said actually cuts across different segments of retail as well. I don't think any segment of retail would not find relevance in what you said uh, right now, be it grocery, be it uh, fashion or anything. Uh, I'll come back to Gautam. Uh, so, Gautam, a uh, question to you is, uh, and 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 from now, you know, as I as I kind of refer to risk, maybe I would not want you guys to think of only COVID because you know. I, I think the whole relevance of this panel is to kind of draw some insights to say that tomorrow it could be X, Y, Z. It may not be a calamity. It may be something else. It may be an economic situation. It could be some some other disruption, but it's a disruption which kind of disturbs business, right? So think of it a little more generically. And being a kind of single category retailer, right, with deep focus in what you do and you're known for it, you have a positioning for it has its pros and cons, right? Because if we look at the previous example, which was mostly above the desk dressing, you know, if this is what I call, you know, because everybody could see only above the keyboard. Nobody was looking uh, below that. As a business to build resilience, do you think that's a challenge? Do you think, no, that can actually be turned around to be an advantage for you? How do you see? Because there would be many other retailers like you who have very focused range or assortment. They want to play in one or two categories. They don't want to have a big assortment. For those kind of retailers, how would you uh, suggest the way forward? Uh, so I'll begin with telling about what I do. I mean, since you gave that perfect example about we dealing in bottom. So look, uh, product disruption can happen in any point of time. Like if you take historically, the Indian attire used to be sarees. So when the sari became a two-piece market in the form of a top and a bottom, there was a big disruption. And I think a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of buying behavior changed. So I don't think, uh, so the two-piece market, what has happened in the last decade, I don't think it's going to go back to a one-piece market, which is a sari. I think it's going to remain a two-piece market. But however, since we are dealing in the bottom, in bottoms, the star product is going to keep changing. See, at, at one point of time in the bottoms, only one particular type of silk bottoms or a Chudida type of bottoms used to sell. Today, I feel the industry is moving towards more of trousers, pants and different type of other bottoms. So even in bottom wear, the resilience has to be there where we are evolving ourselves and moving to the next product in bottom. So that customer shift from one product to the other product under the same umbrella, we have to be careful. Of. So... In any other, in any category, I think that shift within the same umbrella, retailers have to be a little aware and which we are also trying to evolve and trying to learn every day, the, which side the market is going. And, and therefore, to, to be really uh, 
agile and alert about this, uh, I think picking up customer signals is very important. Picking up market signals continuously is very important. Absolutely. How do you suggest retailers should do it? Not just you, but generally, you know. Uh, yeah. Speak with us. You know, we fellow retailers should speak within ourselves. We should travel. I think look once, probably in a few more months, once the, once the COVID fear has gone away with the vaccination and I think we all retailers should get back to our travel plans, visit stores, visit different cities, you know, talk to other retailers. That's how we will be on top of our game. I think if it, if we become a little uh, lethargic and we become a little complacent is when the problem happens. I think if we are doing all our travels and we are interacting among ourselves, I think we will be able to see that change and shift. Okay. I mean, like consumer forums like this really help and understand other, other people's point of view. So I think, Interaction and travel is the most important thing during this time. But I think um, resilience and uh, like rightly you mentioned, one is at a product level. There is another level at a sales channel mix level. Today, um, I think uh, there was retail uh, traditionally, which was sold in a particular way. I think retail, whether online or whether offline is moving D2C, which is direct to consumer. So I think whether you are an online brand or whether you're an offline brand, I think Having a direct connect with your customer, I think is one of the very key metrics of the future. Say people say online is the future, omni-channel is the future. All these things basically say one thing, which is direct to consumer. So I think as all retailers, we fellow retailers, we have to be very careful of this, that the survival is going to be on that basis, on direct to consumer. The traditional way of retail is not really going to be that relevant, say 10 years from today. I might be wrong, but uh, the future is d 2 Absolutely, absolutely. I'll come to Anup. Uh, Anup on the other side, uh, the grocery side. Uh, you know, again, if you don't look at it just from a COVID lens, but look at it from any risk that may come, you know, and, and the, the 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 segment of retailers that you are close to. How do you think those mom and pop stores, the largely unorganized segment, should brace up for anything unprecedented that comes our way? Because a lot of the structured planning, uh, you know, the processes that modern retailers have are probably not available with that segment, right? And that's where you also play a role in terms of, you know, formalizing some of these processes for the, uh, you know, the cohort that you work with. How do you see, you know, that segment getting more prepared to avoid these disturbances in the future? No, very good question, Subhajit, uh, because as I told you that, that, that the problems comes and problems goes, right? The, today is a pandemic, tomorrow is a cyclone, and uh, day after tomorrow, somebody else will come. Whereas the grocery retail business is concerned, it's the need of the day-to-day -day life, right? So if we see overall the Indian retail, grocery retail scenario, right? See, so there are various problems faced by these retailers. And unfortunately, I will say that uh, most of the retail conferences or uh, any of the retail panel, most of the time we will talk about the consumer side or maybe a supply chain side. See, in my philosophy that a country like India, retail is already there. We need modernizing retail. Whether it's a D2C, omni-channel or B2C, whatever we say, ultimately, the producer who produce and the consumer who consume and in between there is a retailer it can be an offline retailer or it can be an online retailer or it can be an omnichannel retailer. definitely during this pandemic time irrespective of retail category what i can see the country this is my global experience which i can say that country like india it need a omnichannel presence because the consumer today it need multiple options to buy the product because Indian consumer behavior is not consistent in respective of category. Sometimes if he's a comfort, maybe he want to buy online. Maybe he want to, uh, let's say category like a grocery, he want to order on call. Or maybe he want to walk through and you uh, nearby Kirana stores. So to be very frank, uh, keeping in mind the consumer changing because everything moves according to the need of the market. So in a grocery, there is a big myth that discount and offers most, I say no. First of all, the need, because we, we need to understand the per capita of the per capita income of the Indian consumer and how much he spend on the grocery. So in my view, the first comes the need, 
Second is availability of the product and the assortment, what the consumer is looking, which is all about the supply chain. And third is a basically, you can say the convenience because the grocery business is all about convenience. It's not about the price. So convenience can be a availability, all these two, three points, and also can be a home delivery, can be a credit sales. And fourth is a maybe a loyalty, value offers, which every consumer is looking. So I think a, a country like India, the sector which was the biggest highlight, right, which was the grocery retail, right. Whereas I think uh, in a GDP, whereas we are almost contributing around 11% of the total country's GDP, GDP of the retail, overall retail, and 8% of the country's employment, which has come from the retail. So I think there are a lot of voice has to be there in terms of preparing various policies. Whereas basically the standalone retail can be modernized and can be well equipped to serve consumer better. And, and of course, to sustain and survive in terms of upcoming, basically fast changing consumer behaviors, right? See, ultimately, whatever the disruption, especially in grocery retail, what we can see because on the ground, Trust me, the traditional Kirana stores, especially in tier one and tier two, is business is reducing since last couple of months. Right. The reason why the modern retail is getting ready. A lot of new players are coming in the market. So traditional retail ecosystem has to be empowered because they are the backbone of the economy. Right. So more and more people basically should think irrespective of the category that most of the people will talk about consumer and product side. But I think from a forum like Rai or all these things, basically, I think we also should address that how the Indian retailer, standalone retailer can be empowered, whether it's a garments, whether it's an electronic shop, whether it's a sweet shop. So if we see the mi very, very micro level, there's a large opportunities for any category players in terms of serving existing ecosystem. That's what I believe. Subhajit. Thanks, Adam. Thanks. I think you touched upon those four or five elements very, very key. And maybe modernization of that segment, like the steps that you take and others take, is a step towards that. Uh, I'll come to Avnish. Uh, Avnish, you touched upon briefly about the changes that you made in the planning process. And I wanted to deep dive a little bit more even then, but I wanted to, you know, go to the other speakers and cover it first. So, um, what do you think it's doing to the planning horizon that one can have? You know, so typically fashion has always been SS and AW, uh, you know, done in two windows, uh, you know, uh, two, two parts of the year. But do you think the planning horizon needs to be really shorter because, you know, there are uncertainties uh, that need to be taken care of. Maybe you need to think of the planning process in smaller windows. What were those tweaks that you did in the planning process? And, what would you suggest to fashion retailers in terms of, you know, what worked well for you? Uh, for us, basically, I think everybody touched upon the point of omni-channel. And when you talk about omni-channel, that has become a very uh, uh, well-shaped uh, 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 backbone to the whole uh, planning of the merchandise process for a fashion company. Because earlier what used to happen was if you had a website or you were there on other uh, mediums of channels on online and, you know, you had to have your stocks and merchandise kept separate. You had your different warehousing and everything. Today, for brands who have uh, multiple stores, more than, say, 20, 30, 40 stores or till a span of, say, 100, 200, 500, or maybe 1,000 stores. So every store today due to Omnichannel is acting as an active warehouse for all of them. So today, whether you're selling on Amazon, you're selling on your own website or any other medium, even through a WhatsApp to a customer or selling customer uh, uh, at their home, the whole merchandise, there are many um, uh, new um, uh, tools that have come, many new companies that have come who act as a middleman in terms of handling your stock like that. So that has eased the process of all the uh, uh, merchandising fashion companies to handle their whole product line. So it's not uh, anymore that I need to have a warehouse, I need to have a, a different area kept where the merchandise will be kept inactive. It's in the store. So a customer can buy offline, a customer can buy online, but the store is kept on a shelf where it, where it is there to buy. 
so that has become a very good tool i think uh, because of covid not many people had uh, jumped deep dive into the omni channel we were hearing so much of omni in the past 3 years but i think covid like how even tejas said i think so many years 10 saal mein jo nahi kar paaye wo aaj ye 1 saal mein ho gaya hai sabke liye so <laughs> in fact the seeing tejas after long is a good thing for me because he is also uh, been driving neeros for a long time and we had many conversations on how to become more systematic taking merchandise because ethnic is highly unorganized if you talk about all fashion categories i think sabse unorganized is ethnic and also never ever ethnic can be a ss or a aw especially our category and also uh, to fashion i think as you are asking for an advice i think there is no more two season format it's all a 90 day process if you want your customer to come so many times you can't have two seasons if you want your customer to come to your store seven times 12 times in a year or maybe every month then how can you have a season of only six and six months and do a end of season sale so when you want your customer to come 12 times is there a process where you can give him something 12 times that's the mindset that we have to come in so i think a lot of western way of retail had somewhere influenced the traditional indian retail to do things differently but i remember probably 5 to 7 years or even almost like a decade ago how things were we were never a two season model it's what we learned from a very well organized uh, uh, western retailers that everything has to be borrow, uh, zeroed down to uh, ss and a uh, aw and do a end of season sale everybody used to do one grand annual sale suddenly you started seeing india has two grand annual sales then you have started seeing the out of 365 days everybody on almost 180 days more more than half are into some kind of offers mm. so somewhere the part of merchandisers when they are planning the merchandise margin becomes a big question so everybody is driven towards putting up higher margins buying at a cheaper cost so the kind of back end what used to be in india a decade ago versus today has become so stressed but i think if we go back to a 2020 uh, 2010 model of how we used to work in terms of our merchandise planning i know many of the brands even the topus retailers of indian origin how they used to work not just ethnic even from a footwear to a fashion accessory they were so robust ki humko kuch naya dena hai daily naya dena hai just like how somebody from uh, mr anup is there from a kirana store it is the kirana model that we have to pick up in a fashion store ki ab uh, now you want the customer to come uh, daily to buy a bread or a biscuit from you when it gets over so that's how she has to come to buy a saree or a legging or a any other product with you as often as she is buying a, a egg or a bread from the kirana store so everybody has to go there i feel a 90 day model is a very comfortable model because end of the day from a manufacturer to a raw material to a retailer to a customer to a omni channel to all the payments involved in paying and receiving and everything 90 days is a very comfort time for any brand to survive on so that is i think probably one small advice that from my end everybody can take up excellent abhish thanks thanks for sharing a best practice there uh question to gopal and tejas so both of you again uh, focus on the right learning right data right insights right uh your view of what things i know and how things can become better you know for facing any uh future uncertain uh, situation so how can you build better on data how can you build better on insights and how can you build better on people maybe both of you take a shot at that question gopal you are on mute you are on mute uh, tejas you want to go first or sure um uh, i think uh, you know from our end we have to stick to the basics right uh, the the critical thing from every point and that's something which we've been saying um uh, abhishek has heard it many times whenever we met uh, that you need to make sure you touch you collect data from every touch point possible be it online offline in store off store um and uh, you know use that data uh, right right and that's where you start from building the customer personification so you have to start going beyond a uh, pure product and it's come to the point where uh, the customer is as critical as the product right and the customer itself becomes the product and you have to start keeping the customer at the center and you have to start evolving things around the customer right so you have to make sure the product is available you have to like you know what you were saying that can i get the customer the product to his house the fastest now if i cannot have the customer come to my store let me get the store to his house 
let me get my store staff to talk to that customer and let it get it delivered within the time period you would have come to the store and walked out right so if you are able to bring in this uniformity that hey i don't care where you are as long as you know who i am as long as you know my product and you know i will make sure either i get it delivered or you come and pick it up and you know that safety is still met right so that's the two critical thing which i always believe that you know you have to stick to the basics make sure you collect as much data as possible um keep a mechanics to keep the current customer informed right so everybody always looks on on saying that let me look for new customer base right and everybody every retailer just forgets about the existing customer who's already spent enough money with you right so the contribution which every brand does to his repeat customer is far lesser than what he or she would have done to a new customer acquisition and i think that has to reverse way around right now even if you you know through the last nine months again i'm saying 60 70% of the revenue which has come where you know every brand has come back to say 40 50% of where they were has come because of the repeat customer coming in either spending more than what they were before or they're doing that second or third purchase during that time because i know the brand right i know my size i don't need to go to the brand to figure out what my size is so you have to start uh, you know respecting that the customer is as close to you as you would want them to be and you have to give the benefit to them to be able to take that last uh, leg in so that's the the core part of your question on you know what uh, should be done to make that happen uh, the other is you have to start connecting your channels right you have to start and everybody says we want to do omni channel but literally uh, you know i would say from 150 brands we run probably even 70% of them are still not connecting online offer right they still believe that you know my online is still e-commerce which is my third part inventory and my store is my new inventory that's coming in well the customer is evolved right? the customer now wants to see the same thing across places uh, and there is enough technology available to be able to connect those pieces to get those deliveries in quickly uh, obviously there is that you know that mall comes in there's a concept of a center which goes from the mall and that's why you do uh, the warehouse but you know those are smaller legs to piece if you're able to bring those experiences in better um that's the other part of it um the third is you have to obviously listen to the customer right take the feedback from what the customer wants um obviously one of the things we have to train the staff uh, in the newer technology so that they are not stuck to what they were doing um like in covid uh, we brought up this new solution on conversational comms now we realized that you know crm will only be effective if the customer walks to the store and we realized that most customers are not coming to the store so we said that i know the staff and i know every staff knows his best 200 customers so we created a technology where this staff can reach out to that customer and say that hey this is my catalog buy and i'll get it delivered within 3 hours through the hyper local market right and then there's a integrated payment with it now we created that as a small solution thinking that it will it will tide us through during that covid period but now you realize that it is it's opening up as a third channel beyond e-commerce and online right there is uh, there is a lot of set of customers who are comfortable shopping on uh, you know vernacular in uh on whatsapp right and there's a mechanics where the delivery can happen within 2 hours so we're working with a lot of the large brands in implementing this concept called nearby shopping right and and get the delivery done within 2 3 hours and that's very much possible to the customer and the brand where that connections are being built and if you've done your basic crm right where you you know got the know how where the customer stays who the customer is um uh, understanding what that previous has bought that experience can you know with a very short period of time can be taken to a next level that i know what you bought last and i know probably you're looking at this and this is my inventory which is available let me connect that and say that these are the five items i can send home uh, to get it done so that's the three uh, four things which uh, can uh, solve for and i, I think you know there, there is uh, no rocket science right i mean uh, it, if, even if the basics are implemented right uh, it will serve a lot of the purposes um uh, you will reduce cost on marketing uh, your personalization will help in increase revenue which we've seen uh, that you know the revenue that the uh, the per customer uh, revenue has gone up by 2x 3x uh, and the cost has gone down significantly lower because you're not targeting thousands of people you're targeting those 100 people who you know you're you know you're going to bring the customer yeah. so as long as that's done i think that will sort probably 70 80% of the issues which the brands uh, will have in the future Gopal, your quick comments. We, I'm just conscious of we have three minutes, three four minutes to go, and uh, I'll open up one or two common questions before we. And there's some audience questions as well. So, just your quick reflection. See, Gautam was talking about 
going and meeting people and uh, you know that's human end mm -hmm. uh the and the tejas was talking about getting all kinds of data possible that is you know we can call it like cyber end or something like that right there has to be a way in which both these things have to be mixed together right and have visibility of all kinds of data and it can be a data in terms of sales in terms of inventory in terms of planogram in terms of hygiene compliance learning you know even attendance of a person what kind of data right and have dashboards and be able to have visibility of that at different levels like there are new types of data which are required to be seen now like say a google my business data or my facebook rating data you know web comments data what kind of things. so new stuff which is there now what i have seen is that even if technology exists the culture of people and again i think they just talked about it earlier uh the culture of people have to be changed right uh that they are conscious so the sales manager of a town or a city should be able to go and see that dashboard and make some intelligence out of it and create some actions out of it right so uh so in my opinion for us to be able to efficiently transform there are two pieces which are there one is there needs to be a data layer right and the data culture which is there within the organization and second is a communication layer and a communication culture which is there in an organization in the sense like if i have to infuse change based on some data which is available how do i quickly make that happen and internalize it at the last person standing in the room right so my opinion is from a resilience perspective it is very simple but it's very difficult have a data layer which will give visibility across the organization for different parameters and flexibly so and have a communication layer which can change the command and control from the top to bottom in a very rapid way right so uh, and this is basically what we enable uh, and this is basically what we do you know, for a living and i think the cultural change is the most important aspect of this excellent so on that note i think we are close to the uh, you know uh, hour i'll just take one last feedback from all of you just one word yes so uh, i would like to say something <laughs> yes sir yeah shubhajit so i think uh, the wonderful talk which i can acknowledge from the tejas that really during pandemic time what i can understand the crm plays a very good role that how closely you understand your customer and how closely you communicate whether it is the retailer or whether it is the product so what i can see that today market is not about the market share market is about the mind share that how deeply and how closely are in consumers mind so i think crm uh, basically is going to play a good role basically that uh, conversational matlab conversational commerce which is also i can see the new word the conversational commerce basically so i think uh, again because there's a pandemic has changed a lot whether it's a supply chain whether it's a retailer or whether it's a consumer so it applies to all that how closely we can communicate to all the stakeholders from end to end life cycle of any product or retail that is my basically outcome of today's conversation shall we no wait uh, i think I'll, i'll i'll just close with just one word from each of you one word that reflects the sentiment of the retailer retail industry going forward to kind of build greater resilience mitigate risk just one word each of you yes right india need modernizing retail we have already retail right india need modernizing retail okay modernizing. retail already exists in the country modernization gopal innovation which is modernization abnish i think in the toughest times think the simplest gautam innovation pages um i come from the crm industry customer first uh excellent excellent it was it was wonderful getting all your views uh, i think uh, there was fair amount of interaction building on each other's ideas uh, thanks a lot rai for giving this platform to all of us and uh, you lisa thank you